Hey there guys, what's up? Game number 12 KZ here, back with another video today, and welcome back to Forza Horizon 4. Today we are going to be doing a Horizon story, so once in a while we're just going to touch some of these. Um, we've already touched these two, right? The stunt driver and... What, what was it? Yeah, racing with YouTubers, the, the low racer, I believe it was. So we still have... One, two, three, four. No, we've we've already done that. So we have four left. But we should probably um you know try continuing that some other time. But for now, let's just start the British Racing Green. Um I've heard it I mean I've heard that it's some documentary that they film in the game like it's a it's um I'm pretty sure it'll explain it once we get there okay here we are solo great to see you we're shooting a documentary about car culture in the UK and I need a second driver you've made a name for yourself and it would be great to have you aboard it's simple. You drive, I tell the story. Let's do it. So pretty much they're just filming a movie about the history of cars. And we just drive. Stay above 70 miles an hour. What the heck? From Aston Martin to McLaren and Bentley. Great Britain is home to over a century of automotive excellence. I'm Rebecca Dawson. Welcome to British Racing Green, a documentary celebrating that history. Okay, nice. The Aston Martin DB5 Vantage was the quintessential grand tourer of the 1960s, combining British engineering and Italian design. Come on, come on. We got a minute and we got about a minute left. A minute and twenty. S oh no! Oh, we need we need to get there in five minutes. Okay. The Vantage featured side draft carburetors and a refined camshaft profile, capable of a blistering top speed of 162 miles an hour in 1964. In 1964. The clean line. Okay, let's. Reclining seats and wool carpets created a car that was luxurious as well as fast. Okay, I mean, I guess this car was pretty advanced for its, for its time. Oops, we, we gotta stay above 70, don't we? Okay, well, come on. Dude, we gotta get back to 70 quick. In 200 yards, you will arrive at your destination. The silver 
DB5 would be immortalized in half a century of cinema. The classic Aston Martin. But in 2016, a new DB was unveiled, heralding the dawn of Aston Martin's second century. The DB11 is the first production turbocharged Aston Martin, but is it a worthy successor to that legacy? The short answer is yes. It's bold, responsive, and agile, with perhaps the best GT chassis in the world. And listen to it. Dude, we gotta stay above a hundred this time, okay. So I think they're just gonna compare in three point five seconds, the DB eleven's five point two liter twin turbo V twelve boasts a top speed of over two hundred miles an hour. I think they're just gonna take cars from like the from like the twentieth century and compare it to their to their successors in the twenty first century. I think that's where that's the theme for this story. Or I mean how they're gonna do things. I'm pretty sure we have this car. Except we just upgraded it and everything. Not the fastest car in the world, obviously. World. But then it's not trying to be. It's sophisticated, effortless luxury. It's an Aston Martin. Oops, we gotta say it a hundred. Still got point one point five more miles to go. Channel air to create a virtual spoiler, providing downforce without compromising the car's clean lines. Brilliant. Most importantly, I think. The DB11 proves that Aston Martin is ready for another century of beautiful Oh, that would not have worked. Cars, and I can't wait. Come on. Bro, I haven't been to this part of the map in a long time. Besides when I was when we were doing the glide circuit. Aston Martins are only one of many cars made in the United Kingdom. Let's see what else is out there. This is shaping up nicely. Time for a change of pace though. At least at first. The next segment is about Land Rover, and we'll be starting out with the Type 3. Okay, so we have... I don't think... It, do we have to stay above any speed? I don't think so. The British Sports Utility Vehicle. But before that, they were actual utility vehicles. Solid, tough trucks, unstoppable over almost any terrain. In 400 yards, turn left. The Land Rover Type 3 marks the point where that shift begins. And we'll be looking at what that meant. We just took a shortcut here. No problem. Land 
Rovers have taken on almost every task imaginable. They've been generators, tractors and ambulances. They've brought peace and carried medicines to disaster zones. They've even been buses. Buses. Over a million Series 3s were built. And Damn. over 70% of those are still on the road today. They were extensively exported and built under license abroad. Belgium, South Africa, even Australia and New Zealand. With a robust chassis and signature Land Rover engineering, the Type 3 also marked the first time that buyers could choose interior options, like seat box protectors and cover boxes. That trend continued, and by 1982, Land Rover were offering the County Spec Type 3. Leisure drivers could choose from such luxuries as all cloth seats, soundproofing, and tinted glass. The trend was increasingly clear, and the future of the Land Rover was starting to take shape. If it's you gone the it, inside. You could already see the shape of the first sports utility vehicle, the Range Rover. While the stock Type 3 would never be particularly fast uphill, there is almost no hill that it couldn't climb, or down for that matter, if you put a proper winch on it. In 1978, a Series 3 was custom-built for Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. It only had 1,892 miles on the clock when it was auctioned into private hands. And it was in perfect condition. It would be. After all, she trained as a mechanic in the 1940s and will likely remain the only royal able to strip and rebuild an engine. In 100 yards. Okay, I just learned something new about the Queen of England. I don't live in the UK, so I don't really know that much about it. Along with the Range Rover, others would follow. Discovery, Defender, and the Freelander. Each a more sophisticated and enjoyable utility vehicle. But none of them were a replacement for the Type 3. They were a different kind of car. The Type 3 was arguably the first sports utility vehicle, an evolution of the design that would lead ultimately to this. The Bowler Nemesis, an off-road racing vehicle that turned into a production SUV, the Nemesis EXR. It sports a turbocharged 5 liter Land Rover Jaguar engine. Okay, here we are. Carbon fiber chassis with integral roll cage. It even has the grill, headlights, and rear lights from a Range Rover. That was close. That was so close. But we're already at 11,000.
This is an all-terrain supercar. That's the only fair description for this. But that's what you get when you build an SUV with Land Rover DNA. Let's go. I mean Okay guys, so this is my plan for the next several episodes in this series. Um so we're going to go back and forth between, you know, all the cars we have. The we bought so many cars in episode 19 and between uh, between the time of uh, between the period of time between episode 20 and episode 19 which was a long time um i bought tons more cars so we need to go check them out and also we need to be doing i know we're we're going to be doing the glide circuit like we're going to be doing crazy stuff like uh, you know um Five laps, which isn't crazy compared to what other people do. People do 50 laps of the glide circuit. But I don't I don't really have that much time. If I did, then I would do it. But I heard it takes 9 to 10 hours to do that. And we're also going to be touching the barn finds, the bonus boards, the danger signs, and the stories. Horizon stories. So that's pretty much what we're going to be doing in the next several episodes. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. And, um... Uh, like this video, let's go for, let's go for five likes on this video, please, and, uh, yeah, I'll see y'all next time, bye.